physician in the middle of the night came to my room. He said, are you aware of how sick you are? And I said, yes. They call it a lot of different things. Death with dignity, doctor assisted death, medical aid in dying. Those are all pretty turns of phrase. Well, it's a murder on request. It's a suicide with help. The ugly truth is we're talking about giving doctors the legal right to kill their patients. He was very politely asking me if I wanted to die and he would have made it happen. She said, I want the pills, give me the pills. It's the ultimate help. The ultimate help. Yeah. That phrase scares the hell out of me. It started with the terminally ill, but in some places, if you're old or disabled or depressed, a doctor might try to talk you into killing yourself. They just killed my mother. I said, it's my mom. Don't take her away. Some doctors have had enough. Instead of addressing his depression, she gave him the means to kill himself. My job as a doctor is to alleviate their suffering. It's not to be a vending machine when they make a good rational argument that they'd be better off dead. But the laws keep expanding. Will this also apply to patients with psychiatric disorders? Will this also apply to patients with Alzheimer disease? Will this even apply to patients with advanced Alzheimer's disease? Will this apply to babies? Will this apply to children? I've traveled across oceans and continents to see if this debate is really about compassion. Is it really about freedom? About dignity? Is everything we've heard about euthanasia dead wrong? My name is Kevin Dunn. I worked in media most of my life. It was my father who got me hooked. He worked in television back in the early days. A few years ago, dad was diagnosed with colon cancer. The treatments were almost as bad as the disease. Dad's worries about his illness and concern about becoming a burden made me wonder. Now that assisted dying laws are legal in this country, what are they really saying to people with a terminal illness? And now that doctors have the legal right to end the life of a patient, what is this saying to the house of medicine? And how do these laws affect society over time? It's impossible to miss the news reports about patients asking for help in dying. They're heartbreaking stories. But is there a side to this issue we haven't heard yet? Where does it end? And have we gone too far? My 50,000 kilometer journey begins in the remote village of St. Anthony on the island of Newfoundland to meet Sheila Lewis and her daughter Candace. I saw a story about them on the news one night. It bothered me so much I wanted to talk to them myself. Hi there, how are you? I don't doubt one. Oh wow, those are beautiful. Candace was born with cerebral palsy and spina bifida. Sheila says she took Candace to the hospital last year to save her life. The doctors pretty much told her to abandon hope, but Sheila wasn't about to abandon her daughter. If I had to go ahead and do what the doctors wanted me to do, I wouldn't have had her. And, and what was that? Well, they wanted me to do assisted suicide death on her. She got sick here at home. We got the ambulance. When we got her to the hospital, she was having seizures. Um, they had to give her medication to take her heart rate down. Her heart rate was quite up, very high, something 170. This doctor that was seeing her first, and he came in, he told me that her kidney wasn't in the right spot. He told me the lower parts of her lungs had collapsed, so he admitted her. And the next day, uh, when he came in, he uh, took, talked to her, and then he took me in the hallway, and he just stood me up against the wall and he told me about assisted suicide death was legal in Canada. And I said, well, he asked me, did I know? And I said, no. And then he said, uh, he was all for it. And I said, well, that was your choice. And I told him I wasn't interested in anything to do with assisted suicide death. And he told me, he said, uh, 
I was being selfish. And he told me that he was leaving and he would be back in January and he wanted to assist me in doing this. And I said, I'm not interested. So I more or less walked away from her. She heard everything yeah. and... This is your story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you said a couple of things on the news story. I remember they said, uh, you know, did you want to die? And what did you say? I don't. You don't. And yet they were talking to you about dying. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's good thing for a doctor or a bad? Bad. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I don't want to Like not once did she ever say to them, I want to end my life. Not once. And this doctor that came in and the next day after he told me about the assisted suicide death and stuck his face down to hers and said, do you know how sick you are? And I'm just like, and when I got his eyes contact, I went, well, I was like that to get out in the hallway. And I told him, I said, don't you ever pull something like that again. They had asked him, told me that she was dying. I believed them. They were the doctors and she was so sick. So but I told her if she wanted to go, it was cool. She could go. But she didn't, she, oh, God, yeah. honey. But she didn't want me to be alone. Don't cry. It's all done now. It's over. Yeah. We just don't want it to, have to happen to anybody else, hey? No. Don't want another family to go through this. In the first years after Canada passed its medical aid in dying law, nearly 2,000 people chose to have their life ended by a doctor. Candace and Sheila's story made me wonder how those choices are really being made. The way society looks at death is changing. We've even sanitized death. We make jokes about it, make movies about it. Video games let players put people away as if they were rodents. One might argue that we have become so desensitized by the culture that even human life and death have become matters of personal choice. As of 2018, lawmakers in five countries and six U.S. jurisdictions have legalized doctor-assisted death. Proponents argue that people should have the right to choose the way they die. Critics say that choice is an illusion and a recipe for elder abuse and coercion when people are at their most vulnerable. It's under debate in almost every country in the world, and the United States is at a tipping point. So, what lessons can be learned from countries who have already passed assisted dying laws? So we're here in Amsterdam in the beautiful Netherlands. Some people call it the most liberalized country in the world. The only thing more famous than this country's windmills are its progressive attitudes towards sex, relaxed rules for marijuana use, and laws that allow for euthanasia under certain criteria. Criteria that one Dutch journalist says just keep expanding. Boundaries of euthanasia in the Netherlands seem to be blurred, and the situation seems to be shifting. And that, that's worrying. Gerbert van Lonen says he's neutral on the issue of euthanasia, but he's concerned about where the law is heading. We are discussing, just to mention a couple of issues, euthanasia for children, euthanasia for patients with an advanced stage of Alzheimer's disease, uh, physician-assisted suicide for psychiatric patients, uh, assisted suicide for people who are not ill but who are wary of life, who have the feeling that their lives are completed. Who's telling the other side of the story? Uh, I'm afraid no one. Euthanasia for children? For people with Alzheimer's? People who are tired of life? What's going on in the Netherlands? I wanted to find out for myself. Robert Schurink is a family physician when we interviewed him, he was serving as CEO for the NVVE, or the Voluntary End of Life Society, whose website asks, do you have a death wish? What you have to understand is that um, in the Netherlands, we're very liberal, yeah. and we think uh, it's your life, you have to decide upon your own life. According to the NVVE website, 
They have 165,000 members, and their numbers are growing. It's Holland's Assisted Suicide Lobby Group. 200 years ago, you wouldn't have uh, needed the discussion about euthanasia because everybody would have died already. It's true, people died earlier centuries ago, but euthanasia isn't a new idea. The original Hippocratic Oath, written more than 2,000 years ago, specifically forbids doctors from administering poison even when asked to do so. And in the Netherlands, they've been talking about euthanasia for nearly 50 years. In 1973, a doctor ended her elderly mother's life. She could have been charged with murder under the law, but she was given no jail time. In the 1990s, Dutch lawmakers got in on the discussion. We had one member of High Court who said, well, whenever someone reaches a certain age, they should have a last will pill available to take their own life. That was here in The Hague when Supreme Court Justice Hugh Drion first introduced the idea of a doctor-assisted suicide for people over the age of 70. In 1991, Dr. Bedouin Shabbat made history by giving a lethal dose of medicine to a patient who wasn't suffering any terminal medical condition. And many know you as the pioneer, if you will, of, of euthanasia here in the Netherlands. Does that title strike you strange? I, I've got used to that. Um, and in fact, um, in, in 1991, this was an exceptional thing to do, uh, as there was no law in sight. Ten years before the law, this woman came to me asking for a physician aid in dying. I dislike the word euthanasia. I, I prefer the PAD thing. Um, and she, well, she was a 50-year-old, healthy social worker with many friends, but she had lost her two kids under dramatic circumstances, the one by a young cancer disease and the other shot himself after his first love dropped him. And um, so after that she didn't want to live anymore. In terms of today, we would call this purely existential suffering. Dr. Shabbat consulted four psychiatrists who were split on what to do. Two said she should be given therapy. The other two said there was no cure for a parent's grief. I came to her house. We had with a friend, a GP, a personal friend, and uh, she was together with her best friend, mm. a woman. And I handed her the drink uh, saying, I hope you'll flush this through the toilet now because you don't have to proceed because I'm now here. She said, oh no. And she went on her bed, we were sitting next to it and she was very happy to drink it. And then she died within half an hour in the arms of her best friend. And what was the verdict in the end? Guilty without punishment, which is very special for your country, I guess, because if you're guilty, you should be punished. So the law was clearly being broken, but public sentiment was clearly shifting. These and other cases paved the way for the Euthanasia Act of 2002, which came into effect to regulate the ending of life by a physician at the request of a patient. Have, have you had people come to ask you for euthanasia? Yes. Have you performed euthanasia? Yes. Robert Jonquier is a retired Dutch family doctor who is now executive director of the World Federation of Right to Die Societies. He admits that the reason people are choosing to die is changing. When we started in the Netherlands, our law, our euthanasia practice and our law, 85 to 90 percent of the cases were terminal physical situations. We have developed the last 15 years a situation where it came, became more and more clear that it was not about termination of uh, terminal illness, but it was termination of suffering. And you can suffer of many things. You can also suffer from psychiatric uh, situations, from existential situations, from dementia or whatever. I mean, 
But doesn't that scare you? Doesn't that doesn't it like it, like to me? It scares me. It scares me to think that it's going to keep on moving and moving and moving. I don't believe it. I mean that that's the big difference and the big discussions we have around the world. I mean the slippery slope argument. Once you start uh, legalizing the situation, the option to euthanize a patient when when he asks in a terminal situation, next you will see that doctors will go around killing. Uh, patients when they have dementia, I think. Yeah. Does that happen? I don't think it is. Um, the simple way I describe it, that's not what's happening. The slippery slope Dr. jean is talking about might not scare him, but the way the regulations keep expanding terrifies me. And I'm not alone. Critics say these laws open the door to abuse of elderly patients when they are at their most vulnerable. My mom, if, uh, if she had been left in hospital without me visiting her and fighting for her, she wouldn't be here. When, when somebody wanted to give up on you, you didn't, let, you didn't give up. My mom is uh, 94 years old. She had a slip and a fall and she was taken into hospital. And the only thing that appeared wrong with her was that she had uh, an infection. Within the first day, she responded very well to the antibiotics. She started to improve but she had increased her pain enormously and uh, there, there was nothing to do about it uh, except to administer morphine. And so they said, well, we suspect maybe she's got something wrong, a blockage or something. The discussion at the time was, well, yeah, you know, we have a lot of things we have to do and, and we don't know if it's worth it because of this supposedly blockage. They stopped to feed her and they stopped administering water. And to me, it was looking like they were stopping and not looking and not going further to find out what is wrong with her. And unfortunately, my mom at that moment said, I don't want to live anymore. I cannot eat, I don't get water, I have pain. You're moving me around, I, don't want, I cannot live like this anymore. The nurse, took this through to the doctor as a request for end of life. And there was a meeting with my mom to which I was not invited. And my mom told me that they had discussed end of life. And they said that only 48 hours and no urgency. So what about a second opinion? So I called for a second opinion. I called for a geriatric doctor. And so we redid the discussion over the end of life story with my mom. Yes, through that second opinion, by bringing in that, that, that second doctor, we managed to stop that movement of the original doctor to accept and say, it's over. She said, this lady has got a reason to live. Immediately, uh, he said, uh, he promised me he would check whether there was a blockage first. There was no blockage. She was allowed anything to drink and eat that she wanted. She just improved after that. Really now she's in an, uh, a nursing home and, uh, and since she's been there, she's just one of the most popular old ladies in that home. You might say, there's an old lady, she's 94, she's lived a good life which is what they said to me. Why are you bothering? I said, it's my mom. Don't take her away. Now, Helen's mother, she was in her 90s. I have to ask myself, would that first doctor, had he known that she was in her 80s or 70s or even 60s, would he have made a different diagnosis? And how would the story have ended if there was nobody there to fight for her? At the moment they gave her the injection, they said they gave it so that she could go to sleep. But in fact, they just killed my mother. Marguerite van der Volk's mother was admitted to hospital for pneumonia, but she says that's not what killed her. I drove to, uh, to the place where the hospital is and uh, I got a um, private call from a private number. And there was a voicemail from a 
a, a doctor from the ER. I called him back and then he said, you don't have to hurry because you will not find her alive if you come to the hospital. And he said, yeah, we had to, um, to give her an, uh, an injection, so she will uh, be in a coma, but it will be a coma, she will not wake up. My daughter was with me and, well, we drove to the hospital and the doctor arrived. It was the one from the uh, intensive care unit. He said, yeah, your mother was very ill when she arrived in the hospital. And um, I had to decide what to do. Well, we didn't treat her, but we gave her an injection that she went into coma because she was so oppressed. So I said, but why? Why didn't you intubate her? And he said, I called the GP. And the GP said she was lonely, she was depressed. She didn't want to go out of her house and, and she wanted to stay in her house. She didn't want to go to a home. Therefore, we decided that it would be better not to uh, treat her anymore. And my daughter was in the room and she said, what, what did you tell her when you gave her that injection? And the assistant said, yeah, we said, you, you have difficulties breathing, so we give you something to sleep. But she didn't die. She, she went on and on, hour after hour after hour. And then, um, well, we went home to have a little rest. The doctor called me in the middle of the night and said she had passed away. And I said, the cause of death was the cause of death. And she said pneumonia and heart failure. But I thought, I was laying in my bed, thought, no, that was not. It was that little injection you gave her. So, I asked for an interview with the doctor of the intensive care who had made a decision. And I said to him, it was my mother. She was not that ill that, she had, that I thought she would die within a few days. And he said, the decision to let her go or to let her live, you couldn't make because you were not there, so I made it. They said my mother was depressed, but she was not depressed. They say that self-determination is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But in this case, was it self-determination? No, absolutely not. The decision is not for a doctor who said, well, long and intensive care, yeah, not good in society, okay. Okay, put her in that room, she's going to die. Next patient. Some politicians in the Netherlands are wondering if the country's laws are becoming more dangerous than the diseases. Uh, see the slippery slope in uh, our country. Kees van der Stahl says he has a warning for the rest of the world. From my point of view, it's a very important task of government to protect the life of the citizens. And um, um, what we now see is undermining of um, uh, the, the rights uh, of life, uh, undermining of vulnerable uh, people or medically uh, fragile or socially um, vulnerable, um, that it's no longer evident that their lives is worthy. You had this law in 2002, the, the, the law that was passed. Um, how do you explain it to people, the slippery slope, in very, very simple terms? Each year there are more situations brought under this euthanasia law. Uh, in the last 10 years, now a growing number from two groups, that was people with dementia, um, uh, and, 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 and the other group is people with uh, psychological uh, or psychiatric suffering. That's not at the end of their life, uh, but it were two categories um, that are expanding now In the past 10 years, the number of people seeking euthanasia in the Netherlands has more than tripled from 2,000 to 6,000 annually. 200 of those are people with dementia and mental illness. Euthanasia now represents 5% of all deaths annually here in the Netherlands. 
Now this doesn't seem to bother Dr. Shabbat, who is the pioneer of euthanasia here, although he does fear the genie is out of the bottle. We do slide down with demented brain diseases and psychiatric cases. Over 216, these two groups together were 200 of the 6,000. That's small. That's always the argument the review committee says, well, worry, Mr. Shabbat, it's only 200 cases and we do you know, 6,000. What is the percentage? It's, it's less than 2% or so. So that's the way they reassure the public. But I say, well, it may be only one or two percent, but look at the steep rise in seven years. Look at the percentage done by the life ending clinic without a treatment relationship. And then you see that people who are fighting their fear of life and fighting against death flock to the life ending clinic. And then you see that there is in those brain diseases a slippery slope. End of life clinics like this one in the Netherlands are increasingly popular options for patients whose doctors will not agree to end their lives. You're the experts in euthanasia. Yes, absolutely. We are a second chance for a person that is not having uh, the possibility to have his euthanasia wish uh, honored by the uh, by, by the own GP in, in particular. Is your organization work in consultation with the health department or the hospitals or are you a standalone? No, we're a, we're a standalone org, org, organization, fully in, independent. And uh, it was notified that there were a group of people who had difficulties to have uh, a response for their requests from their own doctor. Can you give us a ratio of, of how many people call, uh, request a euthanasia at the end-of-life clinic? Well, roughly uh, it's one-third, one-third and one-third. One-third uh, we can honor the um, uh, request. So one-third will have euthanasia. How much time will the doctor spend with the patient um, uh, who's requested this? Normally that's an interview of about uh, one to one and one and a half hour. And on average, uh, four or five of these in interviews are, are being done be before they, they end up in the conclusion that they will provide euth euthanasia. How does the end of life clinic deal with psychiatric patients? That's a, that's a rather complex uh, matter. Uh, and that means that um, it can take us uh, 12, 15 uh, visits and meetings uh, uh, before we come to a conclusion. Another reason that I'd like to give is a uh, person with dementia. He was really very well uh, prepared for the moment that he said, there is a moment that I will lose my capabilities of thinking, uh, understanding what, what, what's happening, speaking. Um, uh, and before that moment is, is there, for then it will be ir irreversible and I, I will not be able to express my opinion. Before that moment, I want to, to, to die, which is the situation with dementia. So the fear, fear what is to come? In, that's in particular in dementia, is that, uh, is that situation. Yeah. Is it fair to say then autonomy, self-determination rules the day? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no one else telling that you should have euthanasia. It's you asking for, you, for euthanasia. And only after a thorough investigation and, uh, and to find out if it meets the uh, legal criteria, then the doctors and the nurses working for the end-of-life clinic will provide you euthanasia. It's the ultimate help. The ultimate help. Yeah. That phrase scares the hell out of me. Oversight is a big concern in the Netherlands. In 2016, the media reported that a doctor was charged after euthanizing a patient who had to be physically restrained by the family. The patient had said they wanted to be euthanized in case of dementia, but physically fought back when the doctor was giving the lethal injection. This is something that euthanasia advocates are even upset about. My simple answer is, that is a crime. That is just a criminal act by, by a medical professional. Because she said, I don't want it, and he still did it. That is murder. Simple as that. Just 10 seconds before I put the injection in, I say, look in the eyes, and I say, is this what you really want? And if you say, 
I'm hesitating. I stop immediately. And maybe after five minutes, you say, yeah, I'm I mean, that's the kind of thing which is happening. And if the patient has written down whatever, if you orally say no, then no is the answer. Dr. jean Quire says it's murder, but a legal review found the euthanasia was performed in good faith. In good faith? Critics worry that there are more stories we aren't hearing. What we see is that there are more situations that there was a declaration of their will uh, to have euthanasia when they should have problems with dementia, uh, the dementia later on in their lives. Sometimes uh, the people are in, indeed given um, something in their, in, in their apple sauce or, or in, the, in the coffee uh, uh, to make them quiet and then to give the, the deadly injection. Some people express their wish to be euthanized in advanced directives, also called living wills. The problem is people can change their mind, but the living wills are considered legally binding. 220 Dutch doctors recently published an advertisement in a national newspaper saying our moral reluctance to end the life of a defenseless human being is too big. The doctors believe it's wrong to kill a patient based on a statement they can no longer confirm. Rob Bruntink is a journalist covering palliative care in the Netherlands. He says what terminal patients are looking for is comfort and compassion, not a way to kill themselves. They have this written will or, or advanced directive about uh, euthanasia, but when, uh, when it comes to a certain point, their wishes um, to have this euthanasia doesn't exist anymore when they feel the care and, and the attention and love and warmth that people can give to uh, a patient in a hospice. He says euthanasia is increasingly becoming a catch-all solution for problems society would rather not tackle. Because you have to talk about all those things like uh, difficult stuff, uh, hope, uh, suffering, a uh, lot of uh, nasty symptoms. Uh, euthanasia is kind of a clean subject. Well, you suffer, well, we can end it. Well, cool, let's do it. Uh, so I guess that's one of the reasons why we talk a lot about euthanasia and almost nothing about palliative care in general. But despite the concerns, euthanasia is becoming more popular and more accepted in the Netherlands. And there's no better proof of that than the annual Week of Euthanasia organized by the NVVE, Voluntary End of Life Society. Most people come to Amsterdam for a holiday. I'm here for Euthanasia Week. I've never understood this uh, Euthanasia Week. It's, it's very odd in my view, but it's every year uh, Euthanasia Week is being organized by the, the Right to Die Laws or the Dying in Dignity uh, Association in the Netherlands. And most of the time what you see is um, documentaries and television of proponents of euthanasia. So every year there are new documentaries where euthanasia tends to be um, depicted in a very positive way. Is it news or propaganda? It's propaganda, yeah, sure. We talk about euthanasia for about 30 years already, almost daily. So uh, we don't need a week of euthanasia in Holland. We have almost 51 weeks of euthanasia. Maybe we have one week of palliative care. Euthanasia Week held a symposium specifically for people under 40 years old. Under Dutch law, anybody over 16 can ask for euthanasia, and under certain circumstances, they will consider it for children as young as 12. And under the Groningen Protocol, even newborns can be euthanized under certain criteria. One of the big reasons why we came was this uh, youth symposium the, hosted by the NVVE. I'm going to read you uh, a little piece from their advertisement. It says, euthanasia and young people is not an obvious combination. Therefore, keep NVVE youth on your calendar this year for another symposium. Why is it important to get the young people involved in this debate? And because young people have in several ways to deal with uh, end of life. Their grandfather, grandmother yeah. sometimes passes away, so they have questions about euthanasia or assisted dying. We, we don't promote people to take, their, to take uh, everything into their uh, own hands, but whenever they want to, we provide them with information 
how, what's the best way to do is. One of those young people who came to the conference is Aurelia Browers. She came to the symposium because she wants to die. So Aurelia, uh, what is today all about? Why is it important for you to be here today? Um, well, um, I'm very interested um, in uh, euthanasia and um, I'm, uh, I have severe psychiatric <laughs> psychiatric <laughs> yeah psychiatric yeah. um, problems uh -huh. and um, I want um, I want to have euthanasia because I have, I have um, problems uh, for about 13 years and I have a death wish for about six years uh -huh. and I've tried to get um, uh, euthanasia for about four years and I, I don't get it. You don't get it. And I would just uh, want to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I even uh, go so far to get into politics mm -hmm. um, to fight um, for a better law for all patients, uh, in, in, uh, for all psychiatric patients mm -hmm. um, to get uh, a better chance to, mm -hmm. to get uh, euthanasia if they are if they are not treatable anymore. We've just met, we've connected, you yeah. and me, we've connected. Yeah. And you seem happy, I mean, uh, yeah. smiling. But that's um, the problem with, um, with psychiatric patients. Yeah. Um, but, um, they, um, um, and most of them seem happy. Yes. And so uh, most people, uh, most doctors, they think, oh, they look happy. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't give them euthanasia, but you don't know what happens when they got home. Right. Then I, um, maybe when I go home, right. I go to the bathroom, I get a knife, and mm -hmm. I, and I cut my skin now. And what if tomorrow, what if tomorrow, they said, we're going to give you as much support as you need, and we found a cure, we've we found something. Would you change your mind? I don't think there is any any cure for me left. Mm. Um, so I, no hope. No, no, I, I don't believe there is any. I have to ask the question: Who has failed her? Has the healthcare system failed her? And I can't help but think of her and just see how beautiful she is. I want to give you a big hug. Um, <laughs> uh, you so, may. So, okay, 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 good. good. <laughs> because uh, you know. To me, this isn't treatment. This is abandoning someone in their time of greatest need. If euthanasia for the terminally ill leads to euthanasia for the non-terminally ill, which leads to euthanasia for the psychologically ill, where does it end? How about euthanasia for people who are simply tired of being alive? In fact, right now in Parliament, they're discussing a new law that would allow completely healthy people who are tired of life to end their life with the help of a physician. There are two proposals now, one by the government and one by a liberal opposition party. And both want to enact assisted suicide for people who are not ill, who are not suffering from any illness, but who have the feeling that they are wary of life, that their life is completed, that their life is, has become pointless. Uh, the one proposal is of a party who say this should be only elderly people should qualify for this kind of assisted suicide. The other proposal says no, there shouldn't be any age limit. An 18 year old girl or boy should also qualify for assisted suicide if he or she believes that uh, their lives are pointless. In the Netherlands, they call it the completed life. The discussion about completed life is about relatively healthy older people who are just tired of life. Dr. Els van Weingarten is a postdoctoral researcher in the Netherlands. She's a neutral investigator who has written a book called Ready to Give Up on Life. It's a different discussion because it's not about medical grounds anymore. Many of the people she interviewed for her book wanted a better life, but had given up hope of it ever happening. Uh, a lot of uh, people talked about for example, the pain of not mattering anymore, not being needed anymore, feeling redundant, uh, being a burden to other people. The study found that the participants' wish to die had to do with everyday realities such as fear, sadness, loneliness, and depression. There was a strong desire to feel valued and appreciated. If death seems like the only logical solution for these otherwise healthy people, 
What did the study propose? It is very important to, uh, to really listen, uh, well, in a non-judging, open way to people, to, uh, well, to provide a kind of ex uh, accepting uh, climate, I would say, uh, or have a really an accepting attitude towards their stories so that people really feel recognized. We asked euthanasia advocates who would qualify for the completed life under this proposed law. People who are wary of life might have some problems with hearing or seeing, but they don't qualify for the medical uh, diagnosis involved in the euthanasia law. We noticed that these elderly people who were wary of life didn't get their wish to have euthanasia granted with the physicians, only when they had severe uh, complaints co together with growing old, like a lot of pain with joints, etc., and, and uh, incontinence. Arthritis? Failing vision and hearing? Incontinence? Aren't these fairly normal aspects of growing older? Are these now becoming the rationale for a life not worthy of living? If that existential suffering is worse enough and you say, I don't want to, to do that, and you can convince me, and I have no options to, to make it uh, better, uh, then you actually comply with the criteria. But why is he coming to the doctor if it's not a medical because problem? Because the uh, doctor is the only one who has the key to the cupboard where the right medication is. Not everyone is convinced. The Dutch Patients Association is fighting against the very idea of the completed life. It's not a completed life. It, it means it's uncompleted life. Their life is not completed. Yeah. And that's the problem. And I don't know how to make a new law for these people. I'm very afraid what, what, it, what it will mean for, for people, for elderly people. Because when we, we should have such kind of law, all people are thinking, well, when this is possible, what does it say about uh, my life, the rest of my life? Uh, it would be terrible. The completed life is an awfully sanitary way of saying somebody deserves to die. Language is critically important in this debate. Look at the title of this book, originally published in 1920, Allowing the Destruction of a Life Unworthy of Life. The book advocated euthanasia for the elderly, the mentally ill, and the disabled. The book was a guide for the infamous T4 program, a designation for anybody they thought deserved to die. Many did die. Is that where this is going? In Belgium, euthanasia has been legal since 2002. In 2013, over 1,000 euthanasias were performed without patient consent, and the situation has only gotten worse. It's become too much for some euthanasia advocates. In September 2017, a respected neurologist resigned from the commission that oversees euthanasia in Belgium. Media reports say he quit after a family doctor euthanized a woman with dementia who had never asked to die. The doctor says the medical killing violated the law and was a sign that advocates were defending euthanasia in any circumstance. If that's how far things have gone in Europe, what does the future hold for jurisdictions that are now considering euthanasia laws? As I prepared to head back to North America, I asked the people I'd met in the Netherlands what advice they'd give to places like the USA. Don't be naive. Don't think that this will stay limited to patients with cancer. It will... Uh, what we have seen here in the Netherlands and in Belgium it, is that the euthanasia practice has broadened. And it is very difficult indeed to limit euthanasia once you've started. So don't be naive. Gerbert van Lonen wishes more questions were asked when euthanasia was first debated in Holland. Will this also apply to patients with psychiatric disorders? Will this also apply to patients with Alzheimer's disease? 
Will this even apply to patients with advanced Alzheimer's disease? Will this apply to babies? Will this apply to children? Those are the questions we are debating right now in the Netherlands. And we should have asked ourselves before we started, not afterwards. It's a good argument against each euthanasia or assisted suicide law. For it don't stop. When you make this first step, new steps will follow. So my advice to all countries what have not such law is don't do it. Uh, learn from the, from the Dutch uh, situation. The next front line in this life or death battle is the United States of America. California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Oregon, Vermont, Washington State, and now Hawaii all have assisted dying laws, along with Montana, which has a defense of consent provision. And as of 2018, similar laws are being developed, discussed, or debated in 25 other states. It's important to distinguish the difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide. They're similar, yet different. In the case of euthanasia, the doctor lethally injects the patient. In the case of assisted suicide, the doctor prescribes lethal medication that the patient would then take themselves. Washington, D.C. What happens here is critical to the debate on a national level. I came to the USA to see how it's unfolding for myself, to meet with advocates, critics, and lawmakers. We're heading into a tipping point in the assisted suicide issue in the US. Alex Schadenberg is the international chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. He says American assisted suicide advocates are disguising their message in something near and dear to the red, white, and blue. They're selling assisted suicide as a form of freedom. And that's, that's what seems to resonate with Americans is, you know, it's my choice. I can do what I want. It's about the value of life. It's about caring, not killing. Catherine Glenn Foster is a lawyer and a leading voice against assisted suicide in the USA. There are cases in the court system right now that could very well end up before the court. And then in one fell swoop, the Supreme Court could turn the entirety of U.S. law on assisted suicide upside down. We've seen it in other countries, we've seen it in Canada, and it's coming. We know that it's coming, and it could unleash a tsunami of, of death on our country. A recent study from Oregon revealed some surprising data about why Americans were asking to die. that very few people are asking for euthanasia or assisted suicide because of actual pain. It's because of fear of future suffering. Now we know the assisted suicide lobby, they're telling us people are suffering and we're going to eliminate that suffering. But in fact, we can eliminate suffering without killing people. That's, that's totally possible. The reality is, is this is about giving doctors the right in law to be involved with causing your death when you're at the lowest time of your life when you actually need good supports, not lethal drugs. In an Oregon study, participants were asked to rate their reason for requesting assisted suicide. Not one rated their current pain as greater than two out of five. Still, many died by assisted suicide. Of all places to come to the medical profession and say, we'd like for you to specifically douse that flame of life that is an anathema to the medical profession. If you were just to replace the image of the needle or the pill with the gun, uh, I think that would make a much more vivid picture of something that I think we can agree would be transculturally wrong. Dr. Mark Comrade is a psychiatrist who co-authored and advocated for the passage of the American Psychiatric Association's historic position paper on euthanasia. The APA's ethics board unanimously agreed that their doctors should never prescribe or administer medications to cause death in any non-terminally ill patient. Uh, and that if you wish to make that a right rather than a freedom for patients, 
we will stand in a position of protection uh, of our vulnerable patients who are already vulnerable to begin with, even before these laws uh, come into effect and for whom, you know, we sometimes are their only voice. So we will stand in a protective stewardship uh, of their vulnerabilities uh, by at least girding ourselves with an ethical proscription that forbids us to participate in helping our patient suicide. That's not what we do. We prevent suicide. The APA could see from the European experience that the laws have gradually expanded over time. And so that's why to establish a position uh, is a fortification against the future. Besides the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, and the World Medical Association all reject doctor-assisted suicide. Isn't this issue about people who are in insufferable pain that are at the end of their life that they want, they just want, they, they want some relief. Uh, uh, and in this case, they want to end their lives. Isn't that, isn't that what this issue is about? No, not at all. This is an issue that's about making the medical professional more comfortable with killing people. Ann Hansen is a forensic psychiatrist with specialized training in the evaluation and treatment of people with serious mental illness. What this is really about is changing the mindset of the medical profession. And I've heard testimony in legislatures where our politicians, the people sponsoring and supporting these bills, will say words to the effect of, well, doctors will have to be trained, da da da, to do this. Doctors will have to become comfortable with, da da da, doing assisted suicide. Would you ever suggest suicide to any of your patients? Well, that's my concern, is that physicians will come to approach this as a suggested treatment option. The potential for someone to persuade or to encourage or to guide someone in the particular choice certainly is there and it could be done. Bill Peace has felt the deadly pull of a doctor's powers of persuasion. The most common reason people with paralysis die are from wounds, meaning a pressure sore. I've been paralyzed for 40 plus years now, and I have only had one wound, and that was in 2010. And it was a massive wound that was life-threatening. One day I looked and I had a red mark on the fatty part of the cheek. I knew I was in big trouble. My life hung in the balance. I had to have a debridement, which is a bloody procedure in which they take all the dead flesh, clean out the wound. There was a real question, would I survive? That's how bad the infection was. Physician in the middle of the night came to my room. He said, are you aware of how sick you are? And I said, yes. And the physician went down a laundry list of things that could happen that I would most likely go bankrupt because this wound would take up to two years to heal. I may never sit up again. That the odds of healthcare covering all the costs that I would be incurred were remote. That I may never work again, I may never sit again. But at the end of this cavalcade, at the middle of the night, he said the decision to take life-saving antibiotics are yours and yours alone. I can make you comfortable if you decide to go forego those life-saving antibiotics. He was very politely asking me if I wanted to die and he would have made it happen. Bill Peace doesn't think doctors should be in the business of talking patients into suicide. If I were a 50-year-old dentist, that came to the same hospital and needed five operations on my hip and limb lengthening because my femur is shattered, would not be offered that same opportunity. And I remember that next day, I called my siblings. I said help for the first time. And I had them write PhD on my chart. 
That was all because I was afraid. While Bill's case does not constitute euthanasia per se, it does underscore the power physicians have under these laws and the real potential for abuse. I'm a human being, period. It's really that basic, that just because I use a wheelchair does not mean that my life sucks. And that's the misperception every time you walk into a medical setting. Your life sucks, you're more work for staff, you're a problem. And that's every person that I have ever met with a disability has encountered that sort of bigotry. That when you go to a hospital setting, you're going to war. You're not afraid of medical treatment. You're afraid of the good-hearted physician that's going to independently decide you should die. Critics worry if doctors in the USA are given the right to take a life, things will go exactly the same way they have in the Netherlands. This is about state-sanctioned suicide. This is about giving the government the right to decide who is deserving of death and who isn't. Nancy Elliott is a former elected representative from New Hampshire. She fought assisted suicide laws in her state and now dedicates her time to preventing the expansion of euthanasia laws. It was at the same time this bill came that my husband um, was very critically ill. He had um, a heart disease, he had diabetes, he had um, Parkinson's, he had a numerous kidney disease, numerous diseases. And um, one of the reps, they had put in this bill, this was an earlier bill, and they put in the reasons why you might want to do this. And they had loss of autonomy, loss of dignity, loss of bodily control. And so I asked him, what are you talking about? And so it was really pretty clear that this is um, what they were aimed at. They were aimed at people like my husband, who, in their opinion, um, Shouldn't, shouldn't be living. He would have been so hurt. It, it would be like saying, you're a piece of junk, you need to um, get out of the way, you're taking up space, go kill yourself. This is Portland, Oregon, the very first U.S. state to legalize assisted suicide back in 1997. The law allows terminally ill patients to request and receive lethal medications to end their life under certain criteria. Welcome okay. to Death with Dignity. I've never this been welcomed our... to Death with Dignity before. <laughs> when I visited Death with Dignity, the organization was recognizing 20 years of the law's passing in Oregon. We're the organization that really works to get the law passed in other states. We work with lobbyists and, and legislators and governors to get laws passed, kind of the political process, the behind the scenes process. And what is Death With Dignity? Death With Dignity is a policy um, that's defined um, in law. And what it does is it takes a medical standard of care for what a physician or pharmacist should do if a, if a patient requests a hastened death. What the Death with Dignity Law does is it tells a patient and a physician, these are the steps that you have to qualify for a prescription to hasten death. Uh, when I looked through your report from 2016, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act data summary 2016, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the underlying conditions was, uh, was diabetes. And, and, and to me, that kind of jumped out of the page of me and said, some with diabetes access this law. And we have thousands and thousands of people who live with that condition and would die without their insulin. So, that, so that's very rarely used. It's not one of the top, right? But is it used? It has been used, definitely. It has been used for diabetes. Because that scares me. People are choosing death over diabetes? There are scores of conditions treated and managed with modern medicine that would otherwise be fatal. But, but the fact is that um, for those cases, you and I have not evaluated that patient, but we don't know what else was going on with the patient. We don't know if there are coexisting disorders. So it's, it's on the doctor then? It's on the doctor, right. That, that's a lot of responsibility to put on the doctor. We, and we want that. We want, if a physician is going to prescribe, we want them to have a great deal of responsibility.
If conditions like diabetes are qualifying under the law, where are the stringent safeguards protecting the system from abuse? The way the law is written is that two physicians have to evaluate the patient and both physicians have to come to independent conclusions that the patient has the capacity to make healthcare decisions. If there's anything in the patient's record or anything that is part of the examination that either of the physicians feel like there is a question about whether or not this patient can make healthcare decisions, then the patient, the process stops and the patient has to be referred for counseling, for an evaluation, and for treatment before the law can go forward. That's what the law says, but this Oregon doctor says that's not what's really happening. I had another patient who was diagnosed with a malignant melanoma, metastatic cancer, a form of cancer that's got a very poor prognosis. And he was quite depressed because he was an avid outdoorsman, loved to hike, loved to be outdoors. And he, he was uh, diagnosed and he was seeing his oncologist and he was quite depressed about it. And she even documented that in his note. And, and he, um, he went to his, uh, his, uh, his cancer doctor and she called me and said, you know, this patient really wants assisted suicide and you know, I need to be the second opinion. And I said, well, no, let's wait a minute. Number one, you know, what's going on? Let's, let's talk about this. Well, what happened was that she must have found someone else because two weeks later he was dead from a dose of, uh, from an overdose of a medication. And so my colleague saw a patient with depression, but instead of addressing his depression, she gave him the means to kill himself. You were the second opinion, were you not? I was. And so they went for a third until they got the answer they wanted? That happens all the time here in Oregon. Dr. Charles Benz says there's less oversight for taking a patient's life than there is for taking out their tonsils. So it's the only procedure that I have at my disposal in the state where I'm protected completely from civil or criminal liability and I don't even have to fill out any paperwork. She said, Dr. Stevens, you don't understand. I'm here for the pills. I don't want to go through chemotherapy. I don't, go, I don't want to go through radiation. I want the pills. Give me the pills. When I was arranging interviews with euthanasia advocates, I'd often be asked not to use the word suicide as they said it was insensitive. In fact, the word suicide does not even appear on the death certificate of a doctor-assisted death. What we should be worried about is that suicides are contagious. When one person does it, others are likely to do the same. We have an increasing number of deaths by assisted suicide every year. And what about you in your practice? The patient that I specifically recall is a, a patient by the name of Jeanette Hall, and she was referred to me by her surgeon. She had a low rectal cancer. So when I saw her, I told her what she had, and she said, I, I told her we could treat it with radiation and chemotherapy. And I said, well, this is potentially treatable. And she says, I don't understand. I don't want to go through all that. I had an aunt who lost her hair and I don't want to lose my hair. And so, so I, she went back and saw the surgeon. The surgeon told her that if she wasn't treated, that she would be dead within six months or a year. Now, the Oregon law says that if you life expectancy is six months, you qualify for the law. So I could have written her a prescription for the lethal medication at that time. But she came back and I talked with her again and she said, why, don't, why aren't you giving me the pills? I want the pills. I learned more about her and learned that she had a, a son. He was going to the police academy. I said, well, wouldn't you like to see him graduate? And that really made her think that, hey, I do have something to live for. She really struggled in her mind as to whether she was gonna be treated or not treated. She finally um, accepted the treatment. Uh, it took a few weeks to give. Uh, she, uh, it was not easy. Uh, she actually did lose her hair, and uh, but the hair grew back, and uh, she was able to attend her son's graduation from the uh, police academy. Five years later, uh, my wife and I were at a restaurant, and uh, she was there with a friend. And she came over and she said, Dr. Stevens, you saved my life. If I had gone to a doctor that 
believed in assisted suicide, I would not be here. I'd be dead. Dr. Stevens decided to help his patient find something to live for. But does the language driving this movement seek to comfort or mislead? It's the King's English. The euphemisms driving this debate are the so-called choice in dying, options at the end of life, so-called death with dignity. Dr. William Toffler is Professor Emeritus of the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. So my wife had died three and a half years ago of a metastatic leiomyosarcoma of the uterus. We were blessed with five and a half years of life once the diagnosis of metastatic cancer had been made, which was about four times what had been predicted. And I treasure every moment that we had. Well, if taking a massive overdose of medication to kill yourself is dignified, then what does it say for the majority of people who die naturally, like my wife did three and a half years ago, at home, peacefully, with family surrounding her, but she didn't take an overdose, so that's not dignified? So what assisted suicide laws do is they manipulate people by redefining terms. Alexandra Snyder is a lawyer fighting against the expansion of assisted dying laws. You can phrase it, aid in dying, you can call it assisted dying, you can call it whatever you want. The fact is it encourages people who are vulnerable uh, to kill themselves. How important is language in this debate? Language is a critical factor here. And as I think a famous person once said, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. So if you can change the words, you can change how people think about it. But it's important to understand what assisted suicide is. Assisted suicide is the direct and intentional ordering of the death by a lethal overdose by a provider, physician, and it's self-ingestion of this lethal medicine, which is a suicide. Well, a typical suicide, if you think about it, um, is a violent, irrational act. And what Death with Dignity does is it adds a dignity to the process, it adds the physicians to the process, but this is very different from a, um, a, a suicide in, in terms of this is a rational act by a person who's dying to control the, the, the timing and manner of their death. Critics disagree. They say the only difference now is that a doctor is involved in the suicide of a patient and that language can be fatally deceptive. Language is vitally important in this debate. You know, whether we're talking about assisted suicide or death with dignity, you know, think about the difference between those two phrases. One of them sounds bad. And when you ask a polling question saying assisted suicide, you get one result. When you ask that question with the phrase death with dignity, of course everyone wants dignity. It's a positive phrase. My job as a doctor is to alleviate their suffering. It's not to be a vending machine when they make a good rational argument that they'd be better off dead. It's like being a lawyer for the defense and a lawyer for the prosecution in the same courtroom. Am I arguing for the health and well-being to extend life as long as is reasonable? Or am I advocating for the early demise because after all, they're gonna die anyhow? And then by the way, if you don't think that's a conflict of interest, I'm also the judge to decide which argument's the best. And if you're not bothered by that, I'm also the executioner. There are about 200 doctors in the state of Oregon who believe they can keep all that conflict of interest straight. It's a delusion. If society is going to do this, if, if they believe that situational killing is the right answer for some illnesses, diseases, some points in life, then it should be someone outside of the house of medicine to avoid that inherent conflict of interest. Because after all, up until recently, there is no crystal ball reading course in medical school. And I say up until recently because for the first time in my university, in my department, some of my colleagues were teaching young doctors in training how they go about ending their patients' lives. As bleak as it is, people have always been free to kill themselves but when it becomes a right rather than a freedom, 
doctors could be compelled by law to cooperate whether they agree with it or not. So a doctor who believes in doing no harm, a doctor who believes that they should never be involved in killing their patient, a doctor who believes in providing the best care possible, making sure the patients are well cared for but never killing them, is now being put into a position where they're being told, well, if you get a request, you're going to have to send them to someone who's going to do this. Well, that's direct cooperation. The final frontier for many doctors is their ability to make a personal choice of whether to assist in a suicide or not. So people that absolutely don't want to participate find the idea of, of medical, the medical system being involved in physician-assisted suicide so reprehensible that they can't even make a referral. The, the struggle as a doctor is a lot of us view it as we're servants of the patient. And then you have a law and there's a tension there. And the question is how, how far along will a physician go? So will a physician go to the point of writing the prescription? Will the physician go to the point of uh, referring to someone they know if, if the patient asks them? Will uh, people say, I don't want to have any part of it? And right now, at least in Oregon and in America, people have absolute freedom. That's critical. That is absolutely critical. I, I feel like that we cannot compel a physician who believes that religion is, is, his or her religion is telling them not to prescribe. I don't know how we could compel them to prescribe. That seems so radically wrong. But if it's a social movement, then, then isn't, that gonna, isn't that gonna start to creep in? Well, has it done, as it has in the Netherlands? As, as it has in Belgium? I don't, as it I has don't, in Canada? I don't, I don't think so because um, as a social movement, um, those ideas are fringe ideas. It's very hard for fringe ideas to, to make their way into mainstream in this country. In this political environment, it's not, in 20 years it hasn't happened. There's not been an inch move forward. Peg Sandine says there's no forward movement in the U.S., but in Canada, advocates support forcing doctors to participate in euthanasia one way or the other. In Ontario, doctors who have a conscientious objection must refer their patient to a doctor who will do the deed. If they refuse, they could lose their license. It's called an effective referral. Critics say it's as bad as forcing the doctors to kill the patients themselves. Where doctors are being asked to refer for assisted suicide against their wishes, against their consciences, and against the moral fabric of their entire profession. It all adds up to a deadly diagnosis. The laws are fatally flawed. I've traveled 50,000 kilometers and talked to dozens of people on both sides of the issue. But the story doesn't end there. Remember Aurelia, the 29-year-old woman I met in Holland who wanted to be euthanized due to psychological illness? We maintained our correspondence even after I returned to Canada. December this year, of last year, not last year, mm -hmm. I got news that my initial request was approved. So it was approved. Uh, yes. Today I got, um, I can tell you, I got from my pharmacist. Um, I need to um, to um, anti vomit medication, and I got them today. I don't think you can see them very well. I think. And what is it? Did you say? It's a, um, a medication, so I don't um, vomit. Oh, yeah. And when I got them, I started crying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So it you was know, it's also part of my uh, cross and also warning. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't um, choose to die. I choose to um, end suffering. And I choose because I don't, because I know what, if I don't go on with amnesia, then I know what the other option will be. I don't pretend to know what Aurelia is going through, but for me, I pleaded with her to change her mind, to continue to seek help, to use the same coping mechanism she's used to continue living, that there's always hope, that the world is a better place with her in it. This would be the last time I spoke with Aurelia. I'm left with the same questions I started with. What does it all mean? Where does it end? And have we gone too far? 
We've seen the law in the Netherlands expand bit by bit, from the terminally ill, to the chronically ill, to the mentally ill, to those who are simply tired of life. I do respect the choice people make under difficult circumstances, but we have failed to find the boundaries, and the boundaries are blurred to an extent that we are shifting all the time. To those people who say it can never happen here, I would say this. I never thought it could happen here in Oregon. Who in their right mind would give their doctors the ability to kill their patients? Who would do that? Don't they see that there's just inherent harm in this strategy? That it could be taken to uh, lengths that they can't imagine? And the laws keep expanding. In Canada, for example, lawmakers and advocates have accelerated the expansion of these laws to catch up with two decades of advancement in the Netherlands and in Europe. They're even talking about euthanasia for children. I believe euthanasia advocates are motivated by a, a false compassion, but I know they mean the words they speak. They hope to end people's struggles with a pill or injection, quick results on demand. But that's not life. Yes, we all fear the unknown struggles ahead, but we don't abandon people in their hour of need. We give them reason to hope our difficulties become the very reason for others to reach out and show what true compassion is. Sheila Elson refused to abandon her daughter Candace when doctors told her to give up hope. Sheila brought Candace home against all odds and even medical advice. She was pretty sick. Yeah. Like, well, they weren't doing any more for her at the hospital than I would do at home. Nurses told me that. Well, she wanted to come home, and in my mind, she was dying. She wanted to come home. Home was where she was going. If she was going to pass away, I wanted her to go in where she wanted to be. She wanted to be home. When Candace got home, something remarkable happened. The whole community rallied around the family to give Candace the care she needed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until she recovered. Candace loves her life, expressing joy and humor, art and music. And a year later, she escorted her twin sister down the aisle to give her away in marriage. I know what we went through. I would not want another family to go through it. After surviving her close call with euthanasia, Helen's mother lived another year, just enough time to meet her second great granddaughter. Build Peace continues to fight for the rights of the disabled through his blog, badcripple.blogspot.com. If I could do one thing, it would be just to undermine the myth of autonomy, that we have this right to die. No, we don't have a right to die. We have a right to live. Today, I'm taking my dad for a checkup with his oncologist. Hey, Daddy-o, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. Pretty good. good. Ready, for your, uh, ready for your checkup? One day at a time, yeah. that's what I say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been three and a half years now since his diagnosis, and Dad is pretty much cancer-free. I have to admit, after the operation, there were times we weren't sure if he was going to make it. But Dad isn't one to give up hope. And that's what this is all about. Hope. He still thinks he's a burden, but he's wrong about that. There's no place I'd rather be right now than by his side. If fear of suffering or becoming a burden are the reasons people lose hope, it's up to each of us to become the reason for somebody's tomorrow. <laughs>